Chest tubes are devices placed in the pleural space to help drain air, blood, or fluid from the area around the lungs and heart. Once placed, they are connected to a drainage system to aid in the emptying of the pleural space. At St. Mary Mercy Hospital, the Atrium Oasis Dry Suction Water Seal Chest Drain System is used most frequently. In this video, the Oasis system will be reviewed along with other important aspects of chest tube maintenance that are useful for the bedside nurse. The chest tube will be placed by a physician, possibly at the bedside, but likely during a procedure. The Oasis drainage system is what the nurses on the inpatient units will need to know how to manage for their patients with chest tubes in place. The Oasis can be found in the pod rooms on all units. When opened, it will look like this. It is sterilely packaged, however, when we need to set up a new unit for a patient on the floors, aseptic technique will be used. On the back of the Oasis, simple setup instructions can be found. Also on the back, a small container of sterile water is attached to the system. Remove the water. Then place the drainage system on a stable surface. Anytime the Oasis system will be resting on a surface, utilize the attached stand. Spin the stand, which is attached to the base of the unit, out to stabilize the container. It's important that this container never get knocked over or tipped. Insert the sterile water into the blue port on the top of the Oasis. Empty all the sterile water into the Oasis. There is a blue dye in the chamber that will color this water. When it is filled, the water should reach the 2 cm indicator line. The area labeled with an A is the suction control. The Oasis will be attached to wall suction, but the Oasis unit itself will control the amount of suction that is actually being applied to the chest tube. This dial can be turned to either negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, or negative 40 millimeters of mercury. The unit will come preset to negative 20, which is probably the most commonly ordered amount, but always check the order in EPIC to verify the desired amount of suction. If it must be changed, there is a small wheel on the side of the Oasis that will allow you to spin the dial to the desired amount. The chamber directly below the suction dial, labeled E, contains a small orange bellows. When suction is turned on, these bellows should expand into the visible window. A triangle denotes the proper inflation when the suction is set to negative 20. If you are set to negative 20 and the orange bellows does not reach or exceed this marking, there is not enough suction being delivered to the patient. You will either need to increase the suction coming from the wall control if it is set too low, or it could mean the oasis is not functioning properly and you will need to replace the unit. As the triangle is the marker to show proper suction when set to negative 20, if the oasis is set to negative 30 or negative 40, the bellows should expand beyond the triangle. If it is set to negative 10, the bellows should not reach the triangle marking, but should still be visible in the window. The B chamber represents thoracic pressure. There is a small white ball that will float on the fluid as it fills this chamber. The fluid, and ultimately the ball, will likely fluctuate in this chamber with patient breathing and movement. From a bedside nurse perspective, there isn't much to be concerned with for this chamber. The chamber at the bottom of the unit, labeled C, contains most of the water that was inserted into the oasis. This is the chamber where bubbles will appear if there is an air leak or air is being pulled from the patient. This will be explained more in depth later in the video. The three columns on the right, labeled D, are where suctioned fluids will be stored and measured. Fluid will first fill the far right column to capacity, then the center, and finally the leftmost column to a total of two liters. Measurement markings on the columns allow for easy measurement and documentation of output volumes. Attached to the unit and stored in a pouch on the back of the oasis is the tubing that will connect to the chest tube. There is a large clamp on the tubing as well as an inline connection. This connector will allow the nurse to quickly disconnect the unit from the tubing to replace it with a new oasis drainage system without having to replace the tubing. The Christmas tree shaped adapter at the end of this tubing will be inserted directly into the end of the chest tube. Tape can be applied to this connection to protect it from accidentally being pulled apart. A small needleless port can be found proximal to the inline connector. This is used to remove fluid samples. Contained in the handle of the Oasis are two hooks used to secure the unit to the bed. This device can be either hung from a bed or placed on the ground when the attached stand is used. When setting up the Oasis drainage system, begin with wall suction. Proper wall suction setup is demonstrated in a separate video entitled Setting Up Patient Suction. Connect the suction tubing to the patient port on the suction liner and attach the opposite end of the tubing to the blue port on top of the Oasis, the same port that was used to insert the water. Turn the suction control to REG. This will deliver continuous suction to the chest tube system. 
When setting up a chest tube to suction, continuous suction should always be used. Do not connect chest tubes to intermittent suction. The suction control unit should be set between negative 80 and negative 100 millimeters of mercury. Obtain this setting by turning the large knob on the bottom of the unit until the needle rests within this range. The wall unit must be set between negative 80 and negative 100, but the OASIS itself will regulate the suction applied to the patient to whatever setting is set on the OASIS unit. But in order to function properly, the OASIS must receive between negative 80 and negative 100 from the wall suction. If the orange bellows aren't expanded properly, always check the wall unit first to ensure the proper amount of suction is being delivered. With suction turned on and attached to the oasis, the chest tube should begin to drain. For this demonstration, this container will serve as the patient's pleural space and the red fluid must be removed. When the drainage container is above the level of the patient's chest, like it is here, the drainage cannot reach the oasis container. This could be very dangerous for the patient as the fluid that is trying to be drained will be trapped in the patient's chest. When we lift the chest above the level of the drainage container, the fluid easily drains into the oasis. Drained fluid first fills the rightmost column and then moves to the center column. To ensure that the chest tube can always drain, the oasis must be placed below the patient. It can be placed on the floor next to the bed if you utilize the stabilizing stand on the unit, or it can be hung from the bed itself with the attached hooks. With the bed in low position and the side rail down, I like to attach the hooks to the rail and engage the stand, as the unit will lightly rest on the floor at this height. It makes it less likely that the unit will be accidentally knocked over. But what about bubbling? The presence of bubbles and what they mean is one of the most questioned and confusing aspects of chest tube maintenance. With the OASIS system, bubbles are only present when air is being pulled into the OASIS container. So are they good or bad? Should they be present or not? Both questions have intricate answers that are important to understand. First, what is meant by bubbling? Bubbles can appear in the water seal chamber. They may be constant or occasional, and they may be small or aggressively large. There are markings on the chamber to help identify the severity of bubbling. A small air leak will produce bubbles that don't extend far from the right side of the chamber. There is a numeric scale labeled one through five. If the bubbles only reach the one marking, that is a small air leak. If the bubbles extend further, the leak is bigger. If they reach all the way to the five, that's considered a large air leak. When air is sucked from the pleural space into the oasis, bubbles will be seen in the water seal chamber. The ultimate goal of using a chest tube is to remove all of the air or unwanted fluid from the pleural space. So when the chest tube has done its job and the pleural space is free of air, there should be no bubbles. But that process can take time. So when your patient first gets a chest tube, bubbling is not uncommon and may be expected depending on the reason for placing the tube in the first place. If the chest tube was placed to treat a pneumothorax, would you expect to see bubbling? Yes. A pneumothorax means the pleural space has been filled with unwanted air. If the air is going to be removed, it will need to be pulled out with the suction from a chest tube, and it will be pulled into the drainage chamber. So, you can expect bubbling to be present in the chamber as that air enters the oasis. If the chest tube was placed during thoracic surgery, you should expect to see bubbling. During surgery, air enters the pleural space as the surgeons work and that air is then removed afterwards with the aid of a chest tube. In both of these cases, you will see bubbling at the beginning of this chest tube's use, but that bubbling should slow down over time, and eventually, there should be no bubbling present. As bubbling lessens and slows, it is a sign that the patient is healing. When bubbling has stopped, that is a sign that possibly this chest tube is ready to be removed. There are times when the presence of bubbling may warrant a call to the doctor. If your patient has had the chest tube for a while and bubbling has slowed or stopped over the course of treatment, it should not return if there are no complications. So if you notice an increase in the frequency or degree of bubbling or a return of bubbling that had previously stopped, this could mean that air is somehow leaking into the pleural space. Contact the physician and inform them of these findings as they may warrant immediate action. What if the chest tube was placed for a hemothorax? Would you expect to see bubbling? A hemothorax occurs when blood is present in the pleural space, so you shouldn't really see much bubbling in the chamber if you're pulling fluid and not air. But you may see a little bubbling in the beginning. Sometimes when placing a chest tube, a small amount of air makes its way into the pleural space, and as it is pulled out along with the blood, it will create bubbles. 
but that should not last long, and if bubbles start to develop later in the course of treatment, that is cause for concern, and the physician should be contacted. Once the OASIS is set up, there really isn't much that has to be done with this system, apart from monitoring it and assessing your patient. One thing, though, that does need to be done is documenting output volume at the end of every shift. Take a Sharpie marker and mark on the OASIS container how much drainage is present at the end of the shift. Draw a line and write the date and time. Then go to EPIC and chart the output volume in the chest tube section. In this case, we will chart 340 milliliters of output. But what if you take over the patient and have an OASIS system that was already set up and already has fluid in it? Over the course of your shift, it continues to fill to a total of 1,050 milliliters. So do you chart 1,050 milliliters of output? No. You'll want to chart the amount that drained during your shift only. As long as the previous nurse marked the container at the end of the previous shift, this is an easy process. Take the 1,050 milliliters and subtract the 340 milliliters that were already present in the container at the beginning of your shift. This way, you'll discover 710 milliliters of that drainage fluid came out during your shift. So in EPIC, chart 710 milliliters of output for your shift. The nurse is expected to replace the OASIS canister in certain situations. If the container fills to the 2 liter capacity, a new OASIS system would need to be attached to the patient. If at any point the container is knocked or tipped over, the OASIS must be replaced. If you see the container get knocked over, obviously you'll know what needs to be replaced, but oftentimes the patient kicks it over accidentally when the nurse is not in the room to see it. How would you know if it's been knocked over? If you look at the drainage columns and you see fluid in the second or third columns when the previous column isn't filled to capacity, that is a clear indication that the system was knocked over and will need to be replaced as soon as possible. If the OASIS is ever cracked or damaged, change the system. Attach a new OASIS as soon as possible. To change the OASIS, simply open a new OASIS kit that can be found in the pod room. Prime the system with the provided sterile water, and then remove the tubing that is attached to the new OASIS system. You will use the tubing from the previous OASIS. You only need to replace the OASIS container, not the tubing. Earlier in this video, we demonstrated taping the connection from the OASIS tubing to the chest tube. You should never need to remove that tape or disconnect this connection. You should only be using the inline connector when exchanging OASIS units. First, clamp the tubing going from the current OASIS unit to the patient. Turn off the wall suction. Then detach the tubing at the inline connection. Insert it into the connector for the new OASIS container. Next, move the suction tubing from the old container to the new one, and make sure the suction settings on the new OASIS match that of the previous unit. Open the clamp on the tubing going to the patient, and then turn on the wall suction. Ensure that the bellows are inflated. Before disposing of the old oasis, document the amount of drainage in EPIC. Then put the old oasis container in the biohazard bin. It is not intended to be emptied before disposal. If the patient has a Blake tube placed, which is the smaller gauge chest tube that is sometimes used, there should be a small adapter taped to the back of the oasis system. Be sure to transfer that adapter to the new oasis container. It will be needed when we near the end of treatment with this chest tube, and if it is lost, it is very difficult to obtain a new one. There may be times when the nurse in charge of the patient may need to change the dressing around the chest tube. This may be ordered by the physician, or you may notice the dressing isn't adhering to the patient, or has become soiled. In all of these cases, a new dressing will need to be applied. First, gather your supplies. You will need a pack of 4x4s, the wide rolls of tape, petroleum gauze, a blue pad, and clean gloves. The suture removal kit will only be needed if the tube is being removed, and that is not typically done by the floor nurse, so it will not be discussed in this video. Begin by preparing the dressing. Open the 4x4s and the petroleum gauze. With the tape, create a large sheet by overlapping strips. The sheet needs to be large enough to contain the 4x4s and still have enough tape surrounding the gauze to adhere completely to the patient on all sides. Place the 4x4s in the center of the tape sheet. If it isn't large enough, as is in this example, continue to add strips of tape to the sheet until it is adequately sized. Take the petroleum gauze and wrap it around the chest tube at the entrance site. In this example, a Blake tube is in place. This is a smaller gauge chest tube, so only half of a petroleum dressing is used. For the standard, larger chest tubes, use an entire petroleum dressing. The petroleum dressing helps to seal the entrance site so as not to allow any air back into the chest. Then take the 4x4 adhesive dressing you prepared and place the 4x4s directly over the petroleum gauze. 
Press firmly around the entire dressing, ensuring that it has adhered well to the patient's skin on all sides. If you need to at this point, you can add additional tape to the dressing to ensure proper adhesion. It is possible that a chest tube could be accidentally pulled out as a patient moves around the room or by any number of accidents. If this ever happens, first, immediately get petroleum gauze and cover the entrance site with it, and hold firm pressure. We want to minimize the development of pneumothorax, and the petroleum gauze will act to seal the site from any air that could leak into the chest. Then, as someone else maintains the gauze, create a dressing just like we did for the dressing change. But instead of wrapping the tube with the petroleum dressing, the 4x4s will cover the large wad of petroleum gauze that now covers the site. Contact the physician immediately, or if the patient is in distress, call a rapid response. When a patient has a chest tube, the nurse will not only have to maintain that device, but also continue to care for the patient. So what are the rules for these patients? Walking. Just because a patient has a chest tube doesn't necessarily mean they have to stay in bed. Check the orders on that patient. They may have an order for ambulation. If they don't, and the patient wants to ambulate, contact the physician and find out if it is appropriate for this patient. Some patients will be able to ambulate in the hall. This is only for patients that can be disconnected from suction for periods of time. It will not be appropriate for all chest tube patients. For these patients, simply disconnect the suction. They can now ambulate in the hallway, but they will need to carry the OASIS system with them. You do not disconnect the system from the patient. Some patients will be able to ambulate, but will need to stay connected to suction. These patients won't be able to walk in the hallway, but could ambulate in the room. You can connect suction tubing extensions to the OASIS unit to allow the patient to move more freely within the room. They will need to carry the OASIS unit with them, as it will still be connected to the patient. When patients are ambulating with their OASIS unit, be sure to check the canister regularly. If there is evidence that it was accidentally tipped, it will need to be replaced. For those patients ambulating while still on suction, ensure the bellows are appropriately extended. If the extension tubing gets kinked or knotted, it will not be able to maintain the proper suction on the patient. Chest tubes will eventually be removed after the course of treatment has completed. Different strategies may be used to assess if it is appropriate to end this treatment. The nurse should be aware of these treatment options and understand how to care for and assess the patient in these circumstances. Sometimes, after the chest tube has been in place and there is no evidence of bubbling or new drainage, the physician will exchange the OASIS system for a JP drain attached to the end of the chest tube. This is to make sure that there is no air or fluid leaking into the pleural space. If the JP drain remains compressed, the chest is healed. If the JP expands with either air or fluid, the OASIS will likely be reattached to the patient until they can fully heal. Another option that is sometimes used to assess if the chest tube is still needed is to clamp the tube for a period of time and obtain a chest x-ray to look for any evidence of pneumothorax or fluid in the pleural space. If the x-ray comes back clear, the chest tube can be removed. If not, the OASIS system will likely be reattached. When it is appropriate, the chest tube will be removed, most likely by the physician, the trauma team, or Holly Favero, the NP that oversees chest tube cases at St. Mary Mercy Hospital. A dressing will be applied similar to the dressing that was discussed earlier in this video. Petroleum gauze will be placed over the site and a sheet of tape and 4x4s will be adhered to all four sides around the petroleum gauze. This dressing will remain in place for 48 hours after the tube is removed. For 30 minutes after removal, the patient has to remain in bed. For 6 hours after removal, the patient must avoid any twisting motion with their body. If they turn their body, they have to turn their entire body from the hips up as one unit not twisting their torso. If they twist from the torso, this will likely reopen the site and cause their lung to drop, leading to the placement of a new chest tube to treat the new pneumothorax, and the patient is back to square one. The care of patients with chest tubes is something that many nurses will experience in their careers. When caring for these patients, it is important to continually assess the system and understand how to maintain the patient's safety during this time. With the steps and points described in this video, the nurse should feel confident in their care of these patients.